Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the called ones of God. That's actually a term used in scripture. It's not just for pastors, it's for disciples of Jesus, the people of God who believe in him. So the message today is about following the call of Jesus. The picture is one where Jesus goes by the Sea of Galilee and he calls out to his disciples. We kind of have the, the stage set as we look at the gospel. It started out with the time when Jesus had heard John had been arrested. He withdrew into Galilee. And then we have the place where Jesus served. It says he left Nazareth, that's where he grew up initially. He lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And then it's quoting Isaiah, land of Zebulun, Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. For those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. That was the place where Jesus would minister. The time was right. We're going to be going through the Gospel of Matthew this year. We're doing series A in the lectionary, and often we'll be using the readings from that. Uh, today it's about the call of Jesus upon our lives, though. And it starts out with that first section, the call is to all people. It was predicted Jesus would be uh, born in Bethlehem, and he went to Egypt, and then his family went up and settled in Nazareth. But as mentioned, the, the time was come for his ministry to really get going. And he settled by Capernaum. Capernaum is on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. And it was significant that he do that. One, it was prophesied that uh, the Messiah would be from the north like that. It's about 70 miles or so north of Jerusalem. But also, I think there's another point. The point is, the call is for all people. Because see, even though Jesus was Jewish and called a bunch of Jewish men to follow after him, it's for all. It's for all. And I think that's the significance here, that it's for Gentiles as well. Very interesting because Matthew's the one who points this out again. Matthew was a Jewish man, and yet he brings out that Jesus is for all. We had that before when we had the Magi as well. Um, again, we live in a world of darkness, don't we? I'm getting kind of tired of the clouds. Uh, I had a week or so of sun, so I know it's there, but um, it's been dark. And we do live in the shadow of death uh, as well. Uh, once you begin your life, uh, you begin the process of dying. But it's kind of sad in our culture, we become a culture of death. We become a culture in which uh, people are not valued. From the beginning of life, I've seen it, and I've seen it to the end of life as well. But Jesus came for everyone. I'll talk more about that a little bit. He came to the right time and right place. He came with a message, and his message was one that connected with John. It says in verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach. What did he say? Repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king has arrived. He's come. God's kingdom, his rule in our lives is there. So repent and turn from your sins. It's kind of like, you know, we go our own way, don't we? We go here, we go there, we're like sheep, we get confused. Uh, sometimes we don't know which way to go. The beautiful truth of our confessions is it says, you want to know where the church is and what, uh, what the church does? A ch the church is the people who listen to the voice of the shepherd. It's a beautiful thing. I had the privilege of going years ago to, to Israel, and the shepherd would go ahead of the sheep, and he would call them by name, and they would just follow after him. Left to themselves, they go around. But we repent from those things that are contrary to what God wants us to do. Thoughts words, 
deeds or lack of deeds. We need to turn, turn away from our way and turn to God's way. That's what repent is. Change your mind, change your heart, uh, change your behavior because of what God has done for you and the truth of God's word. Again, the message connects with John the baptizer because he said the same thing. Kingdom of heaven is near, repent. We see that in the book of Acts as well. And it's interesting, the book of Acts is about uh, Gentiles coming to Jesus, the message spreading around the world. And it says this in Acts 11, the people glorified God, they said, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance, but I love this part, repentance that leads to life. Let me ask you a question, who grants us repentance? What does this verse say? God grants us repentance. He changes our heart. He changes our life. And it results in true life. For Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have it abundantly. So we have the call of Jesus for all people. We have the call to repent, to live differently than the way we are, and to live according to God's plan and God's ways. Thirdly, we have the call to come after Jesus. And there's a couple little sections that get at this. It says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, Andrew his brother. They were casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. He went on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee, John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father. They were mending their nets, Jesus called to them. Immediately they left the boat. They left their father too, and they followed Jesus. See, over and over, Jesus call, and we're to follow after him. There is a pattern here, Jesus calls and we follow. The first picture is Jesus calling to fishermen. And then we see them following after him. And the same is true of us. You say, that's nice. This happened 2,000 years ago. I appreciate Jesus' call then. But what about today? He still calls us through his word. He invites us to follow after him. And this verse has always stuck out to me. Did you hear it? It said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. This verse, John 15, 16, is about, see, in that day, the disciples, they would have the choice of following their rabbi. That was customary. Jesus reverses things. He's the one who reaches out to the disciples. He invites them in. Isn't that a marvelous thing? Have you ever thought, Jesus invited you into a relationship with himself, and we can follow him. It's really interesting here, he says we're to bear fruit, bear fruit that abides. We're to be people of life. God has appointed us to such things. Well, how did the disciples in the first century follow after Jesus? They did it in at least three ways. Jesus called. And immediately, it says, they followed after him. Immediately is typically a word for Mark, but it's here in Matthew 2. Immediately they went. How often we say, okay, Lord, I'll listen to what you have to say. Let me get old first. Then I'll leave this. Then I'll do what you really want me to do. No, Jesus' disciples follow him immediately. Secondly, they follow him wholeheartedly. It's not half-baked. They have their whole hearts in it because they trust in him. And it results in sacrifice. They leave the fishing business to depend on him. They have a vocation given to them by him. And what is that ministry? What is that call to? It's a call to, um, to minister like Jesus ministered. No, we're not the saviors of the world. He never intended us to do that. We are ambassadors for him. We are witnesses to him. It says, 
Jesus went throughout all Galilee, taught in their synagogues, he proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom, he healed every disease, every sickness among the people. His fame spread throughout that region. Uh, Jesus went to, uh, or actually they brought the sick to him. People afflicted with diseases and pains, uh, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and, and uh, paralytics came. And I love this. He healed them. He healed them. That's Jesus' ministry, to teach and preach and heal. And again, I don't think that's just for pastors or it's just for Jesus because as you read the rest of the Gospel of Matthew, the disciples go out and they do the same thing. They healed, they preached and taught. In fact, this whole section is governed in Matthew by the preaching, teaching, and healing. The teaching is uh, in Matthew chapter five through seven. We know it as the Sermon on the Mount. Right after that, it goes to talk about the healing miracles of Jesus. See, Matthew's a tax collector. Everything is in a certain order. He's got things all lined up like an accountant. We know that from Matthew 9, 35. Again, this is the back section uh, of this unit in Matthew. It says there, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages. He taught in their synagogues. He proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom and he healed every disease and every affliction. So Matthew's tipping us off and he's saying, this is the ministry of Jesus. Da, da, da. This is the ministry of God's people. We're to minister like him, teaching and preaching and healing taking care of the people to which he has placed us. Well, this is Life Sunday. Uh, we're not celebrating just Lutherans for life, but all those who stand for life. And again, life from the very beginning to the very end of life. It's so significant. The scriptures teach us in the Ten Commandments, uh, in the Fifth Commandment, it says, thou shalt not kill, is how many of us learned it, or thou shalt not murder. In our day, we have, as I mentioned, a culture of death. And we're to be a people of life because Jesus is a God of life. And even when we die, he's a God of resurrection. He rose from the dead to give us life eternal. I love how our uh, catechism puts it. And I'd like you to read after me what Martin Luther Root wrote in the meaning of the fifth commandment. So I'll say, what does this mean? And then you follow uh, with saying out loud the rest of it. So what does this mean? You shall not murder. We should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. One of the big questions on this issue of life, all aspects of life, it's the question, who's my neighbor? And I thought this was so ingenious, I really did. I know people take different positions on life. Uh, scripture's pretty clear as I'll go on to point, but it comes down to who's our neighbor, and we say, oh, the little one, they're really not our, our neighbor, what do they really know? Or the other side of life, a senior who's senile or a person who's mentally, uh, sometimes physically challenged, what do they know? They're not my neighbor. The scriptures say contrary. And what I love about the new version of the explanation given here, and I'd like you to read this with me as well, is how it says it. I think this is marvelous. Who is our neighbor? Read with me. From the moment of conception, every person whom God has created is our neighbor, and especially anyone in need of our help and assistance. Oh, so true. We're people of life, we really are. Why are we people of life? Because God is a God of life. He gives life, life is managed by him. He preserves life and treasures it, and we're to do the same. So I have this slide that says, God values all of life, especially human life. 
It pains me. Maybe you've had the same experience. I've seen on TV sometimes news programs we're to care for the lives of animals. We're so thankful for Zippy and the encouragement Zippy brings to us. But human life is more treasured by God. That's why the creation account is the way it is. It starts with everything being set up and it's building to the creation of human beings. Human life is to be treasured from the beginning to the end. It's to be nurtured. It's to be protected. Again, why do we do that? God is a God of life. Scripture over and over again says the Father created us. He created all people in his image. They have value. They have life. The Son died, came and died, and he rose again so that all people might have life. Believe in the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus, you'll have eternal life. And the Holy Spirit gives us life. At the very beginning, there are scriptures that say that. The Spirit breathes into us, and we have life indeed. The Spirit breathes into us again as we're baptized, as we receive the word of God, the promise of God, we have life. Let's go to the scriptures about the beginning of life. Psalm 139 puts it this way. For you, God, the Lord, form my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I know some of you maybe have tapes from your childhood or maybe even later. People who told you you're worth nothing. You're a mistake. Nobody's a mistake with God. God molded and shaped you and said you're his treasure that he loves you and he will not depart from you. It's interesting, Job talks a lot about creation things too. And in Job 10, it says, you God clothed me with skin and flesh. You knit me together with bones and sinews. You've granted me life, steadfast love. Your care has preserved my spirit. See, from the very beginning, God grants us life. The next verse, Job 31, it's talking about a uh, comparison of Job to his manservant and maidservant. But he goes on to say, did not he who made me in the womb make this manservant and maidservant? We're all equal before God. Did not one God fashion us in the womb? If God's the giver of life, we have to treasure that. It's the life he's bestowed. It's, it's a responsibility. In our own uh, preamble to the Declaration of Independence, what does it say? It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All people are created equal. They're endowed by who? By their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. I pondered that, reflected upon it. I think the order is significant there, folks. You can challenge me on it, but I think the framers, some of them, their Christian faith oozed out first, and they said, what is most important is life. You don't have life, you don't have freedom. Once you have freedom, then you can pursue happiness. But it starts with life. The order is significant. So we have to deal with the challenges of abortion. People make choices that I believe are contrary to God. There's still a forgiving God. But we want to make uh, the right choices, to follow after his call. Once you get pregnant, you have a vocation to care for a child that's in you. And that applies to the men as well. Men, we have to take care of our women. Abortion, what is it? The deliberate termination of a human pregnancy. It could be of animals too, but here we're talking about humans. It amazed me how much things have changed. Almost in my generation, uh, for sure in many of yours, 
We go back a few years, and there was a declaration of the rights of the child, and it said this. The child, by reason of his physical and mental immaturity, needs special safeguards and care, including appropriate legal protection. Notice this word. Legal protection before as well as after birth. The United Nations wrote that in 1989. Doctors took an oath to protect life. We look at the Hippocratic Oath, the very beginning one, there's some things wrong about it because it says God's plural, but it does go to say, I will do no harm or injustice to my patients. I'll give to them, uh, I will not give a lethal drug to anyone if I'm asked, nor will I advise such a plan. I will not give a woman a pessary to cause an abortion. That was from way back, and it continues. There's been the AMA, the American Medical Association, in declarations, 1948, it says, I'll maintain the utmost respect from, for human life. When? From the time of conception. Folks, this isn't just Christians saying it. This is people in the world, doctors. We value life from the beginning. At least that was true in 1948. A little bit later in 68, it continued. It says, a doctor must also always bear in mind the obligation of preserving human life. Then in 2006, I will maintain the utmost respect for human life. That's the last code of medical ethics that's written. They're working on a new one now. I'm kind of scared what's going to come out. But that's been the practice. Why are things changing? We have a God of life, and we know that. What's the question? The question is, is the embryo, is the fetus truly a living human person? The Bible would say, yes. Science would tell us, yes. They have all the chromosomes from the very beginning. They're distinct from the very beginning. We hold these children in the palm of our hands. Breaks my heart. You can go up to this site, numberofabortions.com. This issue's hard for me because my wife and I, we had, um, we had a miscarriage. Um, I still have pain from it. Uh, I was so looking forward to that child and didn't happen for whatever reason. I was blessed after with the gift of Christopher. Frankly, we thought we were gonna lose Christopher because Judy had some bleeding right at the beginning. Um, but by God's grace, he continued to live. And I have a picture of Christopher, our son, who's now 31 but I have a picture of him one month old. I've hold, held in my hand a, a 15 ounce baby who survived birth and I use my little finger to baptize this child and say Jesus loves you and forgives you and will watch over you. And the child was held for seven hours in the arms of mom and dad, in the hands of mom and dad and for whatever reason, God called the child home. I know this is a tender subject. We stand here at Trinity for not just children. We know it's about moms and it's also about dads. It's about moms. Moms who have to make incredibly tough choices. But moms, hear God's call. Hear God's call. This is his child, it's his child before it's yours. He tr hands the child over to you, take care of my child. Oh, the debate is so framed incorrectly. First Corinthians puts it this way, you hear out in the press, and I hear it over and over again, it drives me crazy. Yeah, I'm a guy, okay, you can put that on me. But people will say, it's my body. I have a right to do whatever I want to do with it. Ah, wrong. Not for Christians. First Corinthians says, don't you know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who you have from God? You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Glorify God in your body. That's what we're to do. 
I'm going to skip past 1 Thessalonians. Basically, it says God's will is that we use our bodies in a holy way. We don't have lust and, and say, it's not my problem. No, no, no. We have to take care of moms and children and going through struggles. And we have to make decisions about not it being about us. Look what Jesus said later in Matthew. He told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, same thing, listen to his call, follow after him, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross and follow me. I'm afraid of what it's going to mean in my life. God says, deny yourself, care for others. Lest you think that's not the tenor of Scripture, go to Philippians. It says, in humility, this verse shocks me, count others more significant than yourselves. That's right. Look not just to your own interests, look to the interests of others. I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 18. Special verse, I think it means a little broader than what's put here, but I think there's a point. Jesus says, see that you, not, you do not despise one of these little ones. I tell you in heaven, their angels all see, always see the face of my Father who's in heaven. Notice there, it's not a guardian angel, a single. It's many. God cares for his little ones. And whether it's little babies or senior adults that shrivel up and we carry them because they can't walk anymore, or they're, again, physically challenged, God loves them. They have value. I could talk about a lot of other life issues, but my time is up. Um, there's abortion, there's suicide. Don't take your life, it's contrary to God's will. Uh, neglecting others, even racism comes into it, murder, hating others. Have we failed at this? Yes, we have. We've all failed. We get mad at each other. Sometimes we wish each other harm. God calls us to forgive. He calls us to forgive. Even when people have made choices that were difficult for them, we forgive because he's forgiven us. He paid the price on the cross that we might live. And so I hold out this challenge to you from Deuteronomy 30, the last slide. Moses said, I call heaven and earth, all of creation, to witness against you today. I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse, therefore choose life, that you and your offspring may live. When we choose contrary to God's will, not only are others in danger, we're in danger. People may say, oh, they're not worth anything, just let them go. Every person has value to God. He died to tell you, you matter. May we convey that to others. Amen.